Hey everybody, the model guy here, and in this episode I'm going to be showing off some tank craft items and then building a model for them to use for their advertising for their new 109 mats that are due to release in January. But first, let's talk about the glue base they provided. Are you somebody that spilled glue onto a table and ruined a model, or made a mess that your wife is giving you trouble about afterwards? Well, the nice thing about these glue bases is they're not 3D printed, they're actually made from aluminum, so they have a nice weight to them and they're very resistant to being knocked over. How resistant, you may ask? I've given one of these to my 8 year old to use as well for his models, and if there's one thing 8 year olds are very good at, it's being clumsy and knocking stuff over and making messes. If you're just as clumsy as an 8 year old, then this base is perfect for you, and you can pick it up at tankcraft.com. Don't forget to also pick up one of their titanium hobby knives and their roll stoppers, which do exactly what they say, they stop your knife from rolling and stabbing you in the balls, because there are people out there that have probably done that. Now let's move on to building the kit. This is Edward's BF109 G6, and it's the weekend edition. And if there's one nice thing about this kit, it actually held up very well over time. You have great fit, great detail, very minimum use of putty, and you have a really nice model at the end. It even includes rivets as well. I was also very fortunate to have in the stash a photo etch set for this aircraft. I didn't use everything from the photo etch set, as sometimes I don't like replacing 3D parts with 2D, and I ended up still using the seat belts and instrument panel. Because this was going to be my first time doing German camouflage mottling on an aircraft, I didn't do as much weathering as I normally did because I was afraid of having things conflict and kind of turned into a visual mess. No chipping fluid was used in the cockpit while painting this. Instead I used a lacquer based silver and then came in with an acrylic color on top. Being that the acrylic paint's a little bit more delicate, it's easier to scratch up and come across with some legitimate looking chips. As always, I try to have my chipping and weathering tell a story, even if it's only minimal. I looked at reference of other aircraft as well, just to see what the cockpits look like. I don't want to put chipping in an area that the ground crews wouldn't access. The Messerschmitt Bf 109 was the only German fighter that had been in service the entire length of the war, from the beginning till the end. And, in an odd note, went on to serve in the Israeli Air Force afterwards, but that's a different story. Messerschmitt produced nearly 34,000 109s during the war, with the majority being the 109G. Even though the 109G, also known as the Gustav, is one of my favorite aircraft from World War II, just based on the looks alone, it is important to remember that the story of the 109 isn't completely untainted, because from 1943 onwards, a lot of slave labor from the concentration camp was used to produce these aircraft. As the Allied bombing campaign in 1944 and 45 moved deeper into Germany and started hitting more targets, 109 production wasn't really affected as they were moved underground into bomb-proof tunnels, and the 109 was still being produced right up until the war's end. Development of the 109 continued right up until the war's end as well, as the last variant, the 109K, was released with a supercharger that actually enabled it to outclimb most Allied fighters. The big saving grace there, though, was that the Germans couldn't produce enough pilots fast enough to make a difference. Something that continued to be a handicap to the Luftwaffe through the entire 109 service was the fact that its landing gear configuration made it very difficult to taxi on the ground, and a lot of 109s were lost in accidents before they could even get in the air. Because the Edward 109 uses the same mold for different variants, there are a few areas that you'll have to blend in in order to have a correct profile. For example, this seam line around the machine gun on the nose doesn't exist on the actual aircraft, so after you've inserted it, you have to clean it up and blend it in. That's not really a big deal though, because I used the normal sprue goo to really bond into the plastic and then sanded it down with a, several different grits of sanding sponge. Because the sprue goo dries so hard, you're able to come in and rescribe the rivets using an airbrush needle or any other type of device you use, like a compass. With the bodywork complete, it was then time to move into paint. After laying down a coat of primer and looking for any imperfections, I started with the yellow color on the wingtips and the tail. The reason for this, yellow doesn't cover very well, so by laying that down first, I didn't have to worry about adding extra paint layers to help build it up later after other colors were down. 
I then laid down some brown, beige, and white tones just to add some depth to the paint that would then be blended together with the final coat. The whole idea here is that it adds some subtle weathering into the paint that I don't have to do later with oils. What's nice about the RLM 76 is you can really see those layers start to push back here on the belly. And I like to use brown heavily in areas that are going to be later showing leaks or stains. The more blending layers you add, the less these effects show through. One thing I really liked about this model kit was the liveries it was offering for the 109. It wasn't one that I'd really seen before with the jagged edges, but it was one that Edward had provided a mask for, and I decided to go the easy route and just use these masks than trying to create them by hand. I had also chosen to do the markings of Hauptmann Gerhard Barkhorn, who was the second highest German ace of World War II with a total of 301 kills. Barkhorn went on to fly the ME-262 towards the end of the war before the surrender of Germany, and then he continued flying for the Air Force after the war. One challenge I did find to this build was finding the proper colors. German aviation colors are a plethora of rabbit holes you can get stuck down. And a long story short, after chasing down some colored ships online and seeing whether the people had researched, I found that the easiest thing to do would be go with some RLM 75 from Mr. Color and some RLM 74, aka Tamiya German Grey, to get the colors I wanted. I know that some research suggests that that RLM 74 is more of a green color, but for some reason on this aircraft, I really liked the idea of the two grays giving it a more sinister look. So that's the colors that I rolled with. That's a little bit of a departure from my normal process of researching everything like crazy, but I also wanted to have some fun building this model. The next one that I build, I'll most definitely use the green just to change it up a little bit. And that one will also include some resin bits too, but we're getting off the story here. Once again, this mask set from Edward was a real save because I didn't have to waste time designing and then cutting them out in vinyl and making them fit. They also made a great test bed for practicing my modeling spraying, but I also had a 148 Academy Avenger that was sacrificed for that. The biggest difference I found between doing modeling painting and just regular painting was the mixture and air pressure I was using. For the painting you're seeing right now, I generally do a six part thinner to four part paint ratio and shoot at about 21 to 23 PSI. When I start using blend layers, it's usually about seven to three, but when it came to doing the mottling, I jumped it up even more to almost nine drops of thinner to one drop of paint. And again, you're gonna to wanna to practice this before you do it on an actual model and the air pressure I used was 15 PSI. But before I could get to the mottling, I realized that this camouflage wasn't as hard edged as Edward made it look in the instructions. I found some references of the actual aircraft and they looked like they were field applied because they were soft edged. So I had to come in and touch everything up before I could move on to mottling. One key thing to look out for and be aware of when you're building this kit is to know that the decals do not have the center gray to the German crosses. I simply used my Cricut machine to set up a stencil and use the same color paint as I had on the fuselage. And if you don't have access to a cutter, that's okay. You can just use some tape and a ruler to get the same effect. Now it's time to move into the mottling. And the big thing here is to take your time the distance from the model you spray, the amount of air and paint you're allowing through, change what the airbrush is going to do. So you'll notice here I'm staying towards the top of the aircraft for the first couple splotches, just to see if anything's spraying or spitting, and then slowly moving down to continue the mottling. Whenever I have the airbrush spit a little bit, I just try to blend that in, and I'll come in later with some sanding sponge and sand that down. One thing to watch out for when you're doing this type of painting is to know that your brain likes even patterns. So you have to make a conscious effort to keep changing things up and being random with the splotching. This was all done in the field and there was really no set pattern that the crews followed. Several references that I looked at, none of the aircraft matched at all. A bigger challenge that I expected when I was doing this paint job 
was to not completely cover the light blue underneath. Yes, there are some areas rear of the cockpit where you can tell the ground crew painted over something, but at the same time, I still needed that blue to come through. I'm also not doing all the mottling in one spot in one shot. I'll actually lay down a little bit of a light template of where I want it to be, and then I'll go to a different area and then come back and darken it a little bit or just change it up. Once I was in this zone, I actually found this was quite a relaxing process, and I'll definitely be doing this again on another German aircraft. After finding a few more references of Barkhorn's aircraft online, I came in and broke down the edges of the camouflage so it wasn't a hard line anymore. And I just used the same process as the modeling, just lightly covered it until the edge was gone. You're probably asking why even bother with the template, and I think what would have made sense was to still use the template to lay down the rough outline and then come in with the airbrush. So either way, with a hard edge or a soft edge, I would have still needed the template to work with. Now that the process was done with the RLM 75, it was now come, time to come in with the German Grey. I will be honest though, when it went from switching the Mr. Color lacquer to the Tamiya acrylic lacquer, I had to practice again for a little bit and change up the thinning ratio just because this paint acted a little bit differently. But in the end, it's the same idea. Highly thinned, a little bit lower air pressure, and just taking my time. I know this might sound like the whole just paint the owl technique to doing any type of art, but the biggest thing I can stress is just practice and play with your paint ratios and air pressure just to find what works for you, and then get after it. By using a test mule, you have a safe place to kind of do that and not worry about wrecking the model. I hope this video helps you out and that you're able to take a dive into doing something a little bit more challenging on your next project. Just like anything else in life, like sports, you have to keep practicing and challenging yourself to improve. That is going to bring this episode to a close. I'll apologize if you're expecting a more in-depth build of the Edward 109. That will come down the road. But once again, I would like to thank Brad over at Tankcraft for letting me have the opportunity to supply him with another model. I would also like to take a moment to thank my patrons for their financial support of this channel. It really means a lot to me knowing that you guys enjoy this so much that you're giving up some of your hard-earned cash to see this project continue. For $10 a month, patrons that have one week early ad-free access to videos, and even at the $5 level, you get 24 hours early ad-free access as well, included with the blog, high-def photos, and general rambling of what's going on in my head. I am the Model Guy, and I will see you next time.